I'm the developer of a, of a package data modeler, which is targeted at pulling, extracting information out of data sets. It has something on the order of 340 functions and symbols defined in it. So we're, we're talking almost equivalent to a, a Mathematica release in terms of the new, new functionality. Um, you've got, uh, you know, fully documented and uh, some, some unique features oriented towards making that, you know, making it efficient to go look at the data, pull it in, get the zen of it, and then to be able to do the conditioning to get the information out. Uh, so, so we'll do, do a, just a real quick survey, which which is going to sort of hit some of the highlights, some of the key points, but not obviously cover the entire spectrum of a decade of development. Um, from that, you get a feel of what I know I consider to be no longer a hard problem. And then, so we'll then go from that and say what's still hard from a, a modeling standpoint. And then finish up with a couple of the examples of some of the way my beta users have been pushing the package in different directions. So to start things off, let's uh, you know, start by loading data modeler. Um, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to create just a simple situation of 10 variables, got 50, 50 records of those variables. Um, the, the inputs are ranging from 0 to 5, and the result, if it scrolls, okay, the result is, uh, this data set, and you, you know, you sit there, and what we've done, I think, is the, the, we've got a model that has two true variables which are the second and the fifth one. Uh, if you were just looking at the raw data, so, you know, you'd probably conclude that there's a relationship to the output on that, that fifth variable, but not necessarily for the, the second one. So what we're doing is we're going to devote 10 seconds to building some models. So very simple. It's symbolic regression of the inputs and the response with a, a 10 second time constraint. Over the years, there's a lot of options that you can use in the modeling, and there are a lot of tweaks and, and parameters there, but it really sort of condensed down that the only, the only button you really care about at this stage for most applications is how long are you willing to wait for an answer. Okay, so what, what we've had is, and the, the algorithm rewards um, Simplicity, accuracy, and novelty. So that's how you get the continuous, you get a continuous development of models. And it's just strictly doing evolutionary search of, of hypothesizing models, and then it's strictly based on survival of the fittest, where the fittest is criteria of, of how novel you are, how, how simple you are, and, and how accurate you are. And those, those get rewarded, and that results in, as you see here, a Pareto front, I want to, okay, there, okay. So as you see, what, what happens then is, uh, you know, this, this, these red dots are with, on the Pareto front. So these are all optimal solutions for that 10 seconds of modeling. And each time you model, you're going to get different things because it's an evolutionary process. It's a stochastic thing. Um, so each of the dots in red are the best model in that there's no model simpler that's more accurate. So this is a trade-off of, 1 minus r squared versus complexity. So this, I mean, this is pretty neat stuff because um, here I'm looking at the, the variable presence tables. So I'm looking at just what models are in the data. And what you see is uh, if you look at the overall model set, you know, 80% of the models have that fifth variable, the one that was highly correlated. 
50% have that X2, but you've got sort of the presence of, of everything percolating along. If, you've, if you home in on the models that are simple and better than 90% R squared, then what you see is a sort of a different picture in that the, the dominant variables have emerged, they've been rewarded, and you know, you've got this variable selection that's implicit in, this, in the model search process. So I can look at the prediction of the, of the Pareto, plot, Pareto plot points. And uh, so this here. So there's, you know, so as you work along the Pareto front, um, you see that the, the first model you're going to discover is the simplest model, one variable, you know, What's that performance? As you, as you move along in complexity, you get better accuracy. But uh, new variables are going to be introduced. Different, different structures are going to be introduced into the, into the modeling process. So let's take a look. You know, I mean, obviously, with the 99% R squared and the toy problem, you're going to be expecting to see some, some pretty reasonable models. Um, So, so here we've, we've got the situation. So, so the, the default for this function of plotting responses plots all, all pairs of variables that are in the, in the model. So, and then uh, holds the other variables constant. So you can sort of look at this green dot and see which, which variables are, you know, what your reference value is. Um, and so this is just, this particular display is the, the models on the Pareto front. Now, if you want to see what the true model, it was actually, you know, reasonably simple. That's, that's what we were looking at in terms of the, of the base behavior. So what it can do is the evolutionary search is looking at um, you know you're throwing into this vat some building blocks in terms of function patterns plus divide multiply whatever as along with your variables and it's just percolating and out are coming these models what you aren't doing is imposing an a priori constraint that the world is a third order polynomial with no cross terms so it, I haven't imposed human constraints on creativity of model form into the thing. I'm letting the data define the model form. Now there's an infinite number of, of models that will fit the data. So what we want to do is exploit that. And if you've seen in those, you know, that some of those pictures, the implication is that you've got a um, lot of different model structures that have, have happened. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a model ensemble. And this model ensemble is going to be strictly looking at, you know, looking at the uncorrelation of the model. So I'm going to try to get a diverse models based upon the relative uncorrelation. Um, going to be good models, one simple and, and better than 90% R squared. And I'm going to actually restrict it because of the variable analysis to only pull out models with the, the two driving variables. And it decided that, that this set of models were the ones that were diverse. Now, if I was doing this in real life, I'd be running multiple symbolic regressions, pulling the results together, and, and having a, a, you know, as broad of a pool of diverse models as I can, as I can get. Um, if you look at this, I mean, you've got clearly different structures. And if you look at the, at the uh, response, it you know, visually looks pretty good. And one of the very important things, why you really care about ensembles, is this diversity of model provides a trust metric because these models are all good in that they're simple and accurate. Okay, so where there's data, they're going to agree because otherwise they wouldn't be good mod classified as good models in terms of fitting the data. But this diversity aspect means 
that where there's no data or your, or your underlying system has, has changed, your target system has changed, then what you're getting is, is uh, d you know, they're basically constrained to diverge. So you've got this detector of, of using, using the model in that fashion. So if we look at the, at the ensemble prediction, what we see here is the range of the, of the values in terms of fitting the data. The ensemble actually does a pretty good job of tracking the, the true response. But you know, you've got that sort of variability in there. And then now as you go out further, that variability would be, be accelerated. So, so what's, you know, what's no longer hard? Timely modeling. We've got this thing you know, pretty efficient. Classic genetic programming would, I mean, we're about three orders of magnitude faster from an algorithm basis from where we were a decade ago on, on symbolic regression. Um, you've got this automatic variable selection. So I mean, you can handle literally hundreds of variables and pull out the, the low dimensional subspace that you actually care about. You can handle ill condition data. So if I've got correlated inputs, it's not a problem because I'm gonna reward, you know, I'm gonna reward the one that best fits. You know, I'll probably keep around that, but, I'll, but I'm gonna get that insight of nonetheless of being able to build a model despite violating the, the classic modeling, empirical modeling constraint of independent, I, you know, uniformly dis, or identically distributed models. Um, it also, also because of this preference on simplicity, I'm looking at being able to handle fat data sets. So I've got more, more variables than I have data records. And I can still pull something meaningful out of that. Trustability and, and then outlier detection is another big one. Um, being able to pull out, uh, uh, you know, because outlier detection has to be model based because oftentimes the, the, uh, the, the outliers are inliers and in that they're inside the data space. Um, so you still have some problems. You've got sort of multimodal, like human tasters, and I'll hit this briefly on an ex example, um, where you know, people, some people love tarragon, some people hate tarragon. So you've got this, this individual variation. Um, so that it was essentially it's a local behavior problem. Um, if I've got a lot of driving variables, I mean that's that's still an issue in that it makes it a harder search problem. The bigger the real subspace that the model lives in, it's, it's harder. And then another one is, is a bounded response where I've got some sort of constraint. So if I'm, if I'm modeling, as Seth Chandler would do it, you know, insurance, well, I could, I could be indifferent to insurance or I could be really not want insurance, and it doesn't matter because I'm not, the, the, what's observable is zero. So, so if I build models that, uh, you know, you have to be able to respect these sort of caps and bounds. And so the, the limit case in that would be a classifier. Still hard, now that you get still data. So, so you got unbalanced data where, where like in an industrial plant in, in closed loop control, it, you've really got the same data point over and over and over again. So the solution there is to, to do some data balancing, slice it, and, and focus in on the, the information content there, or ch to change your performance metric. Um, uh, missing inputs, um, that sort of basically determines your achievable accuracy. The example was we were doing a little bit of environmental modeling and you, know, you just didn't have the, uh, the information about the stream beds that you really wanted to, to understand where the lamprey eel distribution in, in the Great Lakes. Um, incomplete records, I mean, often if you use you know, the wool from data sets, lots of things get flagged as missing. Um, they may not be flagged as missing. They may actually, I mean, people love to put zeros in, right? So you, <laughs> You know, just because it's numeric doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's valid. Um, so it's just a, you know the question is how do I detect them and then how do I impute 
you know, what I do in the, in terms of handling those problems. Um, uh, yeah, coupled inputs. So if I've got, if I've got models that are, if I've got variables like uh, uh, the demographic data out of country data. So female population size, male population size, female infant population, these are all highly correlated variables. I can, they, they may crop up in the models. Do I, do I consolidate them down into a, into a, a finer set? Um, bad data points, that outlier is either the thing you care about the most or something you get rid of, but you know, human insights required to, to make that judgment. I may, in my modeling, want to um, handle a missing region. I mean, I want to peg behavior at infinity, so it can address that to some extent if I, if I understand the physics of the system by introducing artificial data points. Um, categorical data is an issue. So, so if you're doing um, uh, catalyst search, this is one of the applications we do, um, you know, each molecule is a molecule, right? So it's, it's there, it's a categorical thing. So what you, what you can do though is, is use molecular descriptors and you can have 2,000 molecular descriptors. It really expands your, your input space, but now you're able to, to draw conclusions across multiple high throughput experimentation runs and, and, and do guidance other than with a particular one molecule. And then for, I mean, the really big data sets, um, data model really sort of 100,000 by, you know, 100,000 records by 1,000 or 2,000, depends upon the problem size, 1,000, 2,000 um, variables is sort of the, you know, be below that is sort of where you want to, is where you want to stay. I mean, I've, I've attacked some genomics data which has 8,000 genes, but um, you, you, want to be, you want to be patient because it's a, it's a hard search problem. Okay, so, so uh, we're, uh, you know, one of my beta testers, I mean, he, he's really doing fairly generic stuff, um, evolving, um, trying to look at optimizing analog for the, the flash memory. Uh, the thing there is he's, you know, he's crunching along, happily running 50,000 records and 32 variables, at really using pretty much generic settings. We got into, and I, I can't show you any, anything real pretty out of, out, of, out of some of the work we did this spring in cancer prognostics. Um, but the idea is that, you know, when they, when they cut a cancer out of you, take a tissue sample and, uh, and they, they do a profile on it. And the, so the question is, based upon that profile, can they design what, they, what you want to do in terms of your treatment plan? So is it an aggressive cancer? Is it, is it something that surgery is enough or should, do we need to poison you to the brink of death in order to poison the cancer beyond its death, right? So you got this, this decision to make. Um, I, you know, so, so 227 variables, proteins, and you know, but data's precious. So which, which of those variables are the ones that count, given that you've only got um, 104 patients that have, have been tracked long enough that you have the subsequent data, even though it's a you know, fairly common cancer that we were looking at. You know, can you tag the outliers in the data? You don't have every data field, so that meant we had to implement support for missing data because we couldn't throw away any data records a priori. Another is uh, some professors out of MIT doing some consulting with Giovon, who's the big flavor manufacturer in the world, um, saying, it's, so this is a formulation design problem. How do I, how do I design a new chicken soup that, that lots of people are really gonna love and, and get? But, I mean, this is, this is sort of miserable data in the sense that, you know, people have different scales of what they like. The people have, um, 
different preferences. So, so some people love tarragon, some people hate tarragon, but then some people are hard judgers, and their scale goes, even though the supposed scale is you know, one to nine, their scale goes one to three, and another person goes you know, five to seven, another, you know. Um, so there was a lot of work in this exercise to sort of cluster and, and back out the, the human variations um, and, and, and get them classified. Uh, but the net, the net result is they did manage to sort of get some, what the, the Giovanni considered to be some pretty impressive results given the sparsity of the data and they were, you know, they, they didn't realize there was really possible to get too much information out of this kind of thing. Um, and then my, my favorite beta tester is Seth. And, uh, and he's, he's wonderful at abusing things. Um, and a lot, lot of functions have been built in. So, so we, if you caught his presentation yesterday, um, he was, you know, he's, he's in a situation, a very hard problem. So how do, how do we suggest it? He's got sort of boundaries in terms of behavior. Um, one of the things there is you, is you do the, um, choose the building blocks. I mean, you want to throw into the system. Do I want sigmoids in the system? Do I want um, square, square root, power series, absolute slogs? I mean, you could throw all these sort of things into the vat, and the disadvantage of throwing everything into the vat is that the evolutionary process has to then sort through everything to figure out which ones are, are the ones you want. And if, and, you know, if your model, you know, sines and cosines are, are very dangerous in the sense that they're very flexible. They're very nonlinear, they're very flexible, so they can crop in. And the evolutionary process is, is incredibly innovative to work around holes in your, in your thought process. Therefore, the default is really fairly simple, um, you know, plus divide my square, square root, inverse, minus, just to avoid those types of issues. Um, you know, in the case of, of Steph's pro problem the other day, is his, his, he really needed to develop a custom objective because a simple R squared metric wasn't enough. And then, you know, so the summary is, you know, he had to go in and, and tweak the thing, he had to devote, you know, instead of, instead of ten, 10 seconds to getting a model, he had to devote hours to, to doing it. And, uh, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up, we're out of time. So, any questions? And otherwise, enjoy lunch. <laughs>